So today, folks, we're going to go over a little bit more about how to do some problems as opposed to the theory. On, on uh, Thursday, we did some theory and it uh, kind of blew you away, or some of you. And so now today what we're going to do is, is try and do some problems so that you'll feel a little bit more comfortable going into the exam, okay? Any questions? Yes? Absolutely. Question is, are we assigned to read chapter 7 in its entirety? Yes. Now, once again, chapter 7's got so much material, I can't ex test you on everything. Okay. But you need to read that chapter. Why? Because uh, we got chapter 8 next. And uh, um, so, yes, do read it. Okay. Let's get to work here. So, do that problem right now. Yes. What? Is there supposed to be a quiz? Why? Well, it's not happening today, and it's not going to happen on Thursday. So do you mean, are we going to have a quiz anytime? Oh, maybe. Don't worry. Just show up to class every day with a calculator so you can do these problems. And if there's a quiz, then you do fine. If you don't show up, you don't get, an, you don't get a quiz grade. Okay, do this problem. There's no question. A balloon expanded by the heating of the air inside, blah, 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 blah. Assuming that it took, calculate delta E. I believe that's a question. I'm in a pissy mood, folks. You what? Yo, you got the answer. Oh, geez. I thought you said there was no question. Okay, sorry. I got bad hearing, too. Okay, well, for those who don't know how to do it, is that what you got? Good. Okay. I feel better. I'm happier now. Internal energy, folks, is equal to Q plus W. Okay. So what's Q? What's Q in a problem like this? It's the heat that went into it. Look at this. How many have ever flown on a hot air balloon? Okay, good. I haven't. You have. Okay, good. Um, they got this, this, like this propane or this butane or some sort of a natural gas thing underneath and they just turn on the heat and it just shoots this flame into the balloon and it floats. Okay? That's a lot of energy though that goes into heating that those gases up. That's how much energy it says that it did. How much, what's the, okay, what's the delta V here, folks? What's delta V? Because look at this. Internal energy, which is what we were asked to calculate, is both Q plus W. Okay, Q plus W. What is the delta V? Remember, W is PDV, negative PDV. So what's dV? What's dV on this question? 500,000 liters, right? You just take this number away from that number and you end up with 500,000 liters. So you got 500,000 liters. And how do we calculate PV work? It says assume an atmosphere. So how many liter atmospheres did we have? 500,000, right? 500,000 liter atmospheres. What is our, the number I'm not gonna give you on Thursday. Conversion is 101.3 joules per liter atmosphere. So you just multiply, I'm not sure if I got this on the next slide or not. Oh yeah, okay, look at that. So there's your 500,000 liters times an atmosphere, you got 500,000 liter atmospheres times that. So you got about this much, this many joules, okay? You add the two together, right? This is how much energy you put into it. This is how much energy you got out in terms of work. This is what the internal energy is right there. Folks, it cannot, this number can't be 
smaller or negative, more negative than this. It's impossible. If it weren't impossible, then we could have a perpetual motion machine. We'd say, let's just heat up a hot air balloon, put in this much energy, and we're going to get out even more energy from work. It just doesn't work that way. You're never going to get, you're never going to get this value to be there. So it's always a positive there in this, in this case. Okay, enthalpy. So this is in your notes, okay? This is in your notes. And what this is saying is, is that for, for, for processes at constant pressure, and that, folks, is this room. We live in a world of constant pressure. You know, it's not quite constant, okay? On a, on a high pressure day, the barometric pressure might be a, a 1,018 millibars, and on a low pressure day, it might be 100 or 1,010. But we live in a world of constant pressure, one atmosphere. It doesn't change by hardly anything. So in a constant atmosphere world or constant pressure world, we use delta H is equal to delta H is PV. Because look at this. If we plug in delta E is equal to Q sub P plus W, all right? Q sub P minus PDV, where this is a constant. Look at this. We'll go through all this math, and it turns out that delta H is equal to the heat. So enthalpy is a heat thing. Enthalpy tells us how much energy is given off from a particular chemical reaction or something, okay? Or, or how, many, how much energy you get per gallon of gas. So that's why we use enthalpy as a, uh, uh, it's, it's a nice one because it's associated with heat here, all right? And it's because of the constant pressure. Okay. When there's no change in volume, folks, what happens to work? Right? Simple multiple choice question. I could write some big long thing, and then if I say there's no change in volume, you can just ignore everything that I said almost. Um, so delta E or delta U is equal to Q plus W, but with no volume, that value's zero right there. So when there's no change in volume or the constant volume, the internal energy is equal to Q sub V, which just means that at constant volume, okay? So the change in energy, internal energy, is equal to the heat exchange when V is constant. So we have sort of two things, okay? We've got delta H, which is constant pressure, which tells us what the heat is, and then we've got um, uh, delta E here, which is going to be um, the heat at constant volume. I already said that. Okay, so we got that. So we got two things. We got constant pressure, enthalpy is equal to heat. Constant volume, internal energy is, con is equal to heat. Okay, now, how many of you have downloaded the notes from the internet? Raise your hand. Okay. So I put a bunch of stuff on there, some of which I've edited down, okay? Uh, but one thing I didn't edit down before when I should have is this one right here, okay? So if you have a hard copy, I'm going to ask you to make some changes. If in fact you um, have it on your computer in front of you, then this is a problem. This is where I said the bad word last night, or one of them, because this was wrong. On your notes, on your notes, folks, this down here was just the opposite, okay? And here's how I'm going to show you why, okay? If you have ice, ice cube, I got an ice cube, what is this? A clicker thing, huh? If this is an ice cube, kind of looks like ice cube, and my hand is a skillet, or a frying pan, and I have the heat underneath here, okay? What can you see happening? Can you sort of see the heat going through the frying pan, touching the bottom of the ice cube, and the ice cube slowly melting? Can you see that? No, you can't. Okay, have you ever cooked anything? Okay, if you put an ice cube on a hot pan and you turn on the flame, 
What's happening? Does the ice cube become ice cube or does it become water? That's what I'm saying is, is that you give a solid, that solid right there, heat and it melts. Does everybody understand that? Okay. So that is what's happening. You have a solid, you give it a certain amount of energy, and in my brain, it's a frying pan that I put it on, turn on the, the gas or turn on the, the electricity, and all of a sudden it starts to melt, okay? That's this, going from a solid to a liquid. But that ice, folks, I had to give it energy, right? I had to turn the burner on and put the flame underneath that uh, frying pan in order to make the heat go through the frying pan into the ice for it to go there. Is there anybody that doesn't see that flow of energy? No. I don't know if this means, how many see the flow of energy? Okay, so I'm giving this energy. So solid water is given energy. In fact, it's given six kilojoules per mole to become liquid water, okay? So the products, that, has more energy in it than this did, right? I gave this money to become a, a liquid. So this now has more energy, more money in it than it started with. So that the delta H of the products is greater than the reactants. I had to give it energy. Therefore, delta H is greater than zero. On your notes, folks, this says this way and this says this way. It's wrong, okay? It's wrong. I'm sorry, I have no idea how that happened. So, delta H, when I have to give something energy, <coughs> the, this, this ends up, I give it energy, therefore the sign is negative, or positive, sorry. Now, if instead I burn methane, okay, I burn methane, look at how much energy is given off, 890 kilojoules per mole, okay. So these are a lot more stable than this. This gave off a lot of energy, all that value right there, and therefore that negative 890, the reactants now have a lot less energy, or ha had more energy than the products, okay? They had more, right? They had more up here than they have down here. This is the energy this way. So you can see just by this design here, that this has less energy than this. And that's because 890 kilojoules per mole was given off as heat. And therefore, delta H is a negative. So once again, I apologize. The next two or three pages, you're gonna see that this, that, that these turn out to be correct on this page. They were, they were correct later on in your notes. I have no idea how, how this happened. So, Look at that. This one says it right. Okay, this is endothermic. This is your notes, okay? So from now on, everything is fine. Just that one page, you had to flip the signs on these things. So if I give a solid some heat and it turns to a liquid, that's endothermic. I had to give it energy to make it happen, okay? In this case, you burn something, heat's given off, and therefore the delta H is negative. So this is just a reiteration of what I just said. This is correcting your notes. And this is just a, one more thing where if the sign is positive, the reaction is endothermic. If the sign is negative, it's exothermic. Okay. So three pages of the same thing. All right. It's just that the first page of your notes was wacky. Don't forget, you've got to put energy in to ice to make it a liquid. So, I love this curve, folks, okay? This is a heating curve. Let me just get the whole thing up here. Okay. This is one of my favorite figures in Chem 1B, okay? It's got a lot of information, okay? This is energy that you had to supply as heat, okay? So this is almost like having a frying pan that you have set at a certain temperature. 
and then you sort of watch things change phase. Solid to liquid, li or solid heats up, still as a solid, and then it becomes a liquid, and then the liquid heats up like boiling water, and then all of a sudden you go from the boiling water where you have water to where it goes to the gas phase. That's what this is. And this encompasses a lot of things from chapter 5 and chapter 7. Okay, what we see here, look how steep that is. We took a mole of ice. What's a mole of ice weigh, folks? 18 grams. It's not very big, okay? Okay, I'm going to ask you. What would you estimate if this was ice? How many moles would I have? Oh, I'm asking this guy. Okay, you, you want him to answer? He can answer, he says. What do you think? Half a mole, he says. So you're saying that this thing weighs about nine grams. Is that what you're saying? Maybe what? One fourth of a mole. How about you, buddy? Hey, what do you think? Three or four moles. That's a better guess. Okay, I don't know. I mean, it, once again, this looks like it's about a centimeter thick and about 10 centimeters long. So it's 10 by 1 by 4. This looks like it's maybe 50 cc's. Okay, something like that. So 50 divided by 18 is about 3. So probably about 3 moles. Okay. I want you folks to have some clue as to what a cubic centimeter is, what a liter is, what a meter is. Okay. And I'm not meaning to embarrass anybody. That's not my intent. My intent is to point out to you that you're not very good. Okay, you're wonderful on a computer. I'm not. You're wonderful on an iPhone. I don't have one. But in terms of actually estimating something, okay, you guys suck. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we have ice. Three moles. Let's say it's one mole though. Let's say this guy was right. Okay. One mole of ice at 243 degrees. Okay. That's 30 degrees below zero. That's 30, minus 30 C. I've got to warm it up. The, boil, the melting point, the fusion point of ice is 273. So before I can get any kind of liquid, I've got to heat it up. I heat it up. I only put in, for, look at that. To get right there, how many kilojoules of energy did I supply to get it up to there? About one, okay? So I went, one kilojoule was enough to heat this thing up by 30 degrees. One kilojoule, okay? So now it's gone from minus 30 or, or 270, 243 up to 273. But it's still a solid. Look at what I got to do now. I just keep giving it more and more and more. I give it six kilojoules of mole, or six kilojoules before it's become a liquid. Now it's not all, we have a little bit of liquid here. A little bit more here, a little bit. This means when there's no solid left. So it's like puddling up in my frying pan, okay? Got this thing sitting in my frying pan, got the frying pan on, and all of a sudden I start noticing, first, nothing happens in the beginning because it's all just warming up the ice. Then all of a sudden I notice a little bit of pool of water. And then a bigger pool and a bigger pool and a smaller chunk of ice, just like an ice in your drink and then the ice disappears and then you're just with water. So now it's liquid water right here. And then from here up to there, we're changing the temperature by 100 degrees. We're going from 273 to 373, okay? And then folks, look at this. We get to, to 373, this was six kilojoules. Six kilojoules to go from uh, solid ice to liquid ice. Okay, look at how much we've got to supply here. We, th this line is over here. This is where the line goes to. 40.7. Look at this. This number is like 55. Maybe right here. Okay, this is maybe a 50. I'm not sure. I guess if we added this plus this plus this, we could figure it out. The point is, folks, is this requires a ton of energy. 40.7 kilojoules for one mole. Whereas it only took six here, this whole thing, heat capacity here is only 
uh, 7.5 um, or 75 uh, um, joules per degree. So you multiply that by 100 and you get 7.5 kilojoules. So we raised that whole thing in temperature by 100 degrees, folks. 100 degrees and it took us 7.5 kilojoules. And now it takes us 40 to just turn it from, we don't even change the temperature. Just sitting there, boiling off. That's an intermolecular thing, folks. It does not, water likes to be with water. This is hydrogen bonding at its best. If you see something with a huge heat of vaporization, which is what we call this, heat of vaporization, that means it's got a lot of intermolecular forces. Loves to be a liquid. Okay? So this once again has chapter 5 written all over it <clears throat> and now we've got heat capacities here, okay? So it's very important that you understand this figure, okay? And once again, we're going to talk about heat capacity. Any questions on this? Yes? Okay, so I'm not going to require that you know that the heat of fusion is 6 kilojoules per mole or that this is minus or is 40.7. Okay. We're going to go over heat capacities in a bit. I just want you to understand why this figure looks the way it does because you could be asked a question, you could be given this and say, hmm, why is this so much bigger than this? And what are you going to say? You're going to say, well, it's because of uh, water likes to be in, likes to be liquid water. Any other questions? I love this figure. All right. So, let me put a little bit of this up here. So, what you have to understand, folks, because we're talking thermodynamics and because I've told you that, that there cannot be a perpetual motion machine, here's what I mean by that. Look at this equation right here. Methane is burned in oxygen to form CO2. This, folks, is a combustion reaction. Okay, this is a combustion reaction. I'm not going to tell you on the exam what a combustion reaction goes to. A combustion reaction always goes to CO2 and water. And you have to assume an infinite amount of, of, of oxygen, okay? So if let's say you got one gram or one mole <coughs> of methane, okay, here's the question right now. One mole of methane, this is what this is going to represent one mole of methane right here. Look, we got moles right there. Okay, I'm going to ask this guy, okay, San Francisco. If we burned one mole of methane, how many moles of water did we make? Two. Two. Those coefficients, folks, tell us the molar ratios. Okay, so now I'm going to ask this lady right here. How many moles of CO2 were formed? One. Yes, that coefficient right there tells you that it's one. Okay? So you cannot not balance the equations. If I say the combustion of methane, one mole, <coughs> gives you this many 802 kilojoules of energy, okay, the delta H of, of this reaction is minus 802. But I can also ask you how much oxygen was used. All right? You learned how to balance equations last quarter or in high school. So a balanced equation is, is very important. Now, the important thing here, folks, is that whereas in the past we didn't care about what the state was, meaning is it liquid, solid, or gas? You'll notice now, and I never understood this in high school, you know, I didn't know why I had to put these things. Now I do, okay? Gas, 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 okay? So for this, we're saying that for the delta H for this whole reaction is 802, negative 802, okay? Now, let's say I ask you, what is the delta H of um, one mole of CO2 and two moles of water forming one mole of methane and uh, two moles of oxygen? What is the delta H? It's just the absolute opposite of that. You just flip the arrow, boom. So this is going this way and you put a little plus sign right there. It has to be. Otherwise, folks, if it were different, 
perpetual motion, right? We say, well, let's go ahead and make methane into water and then we'll take a different route to get back to water or get back to these guys and in so doing we can gain some energy. Doesn't work, okay? So don't forget, you want to reverse this arrow here, all you got to do is reverse that, okay? It's going to be very important in about uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so let's say here, solid water to liquid water. I just showed you that's an ice cube with some heat given to it becomes a liquid, okay? That delta H is a positive value because energy was given to the system. Energy was given to the ice cube, okay? And so it's got actually more energy now as a liquid. If you reverse this once again, if you want to go H2O liquid goes to H2O solid, then this now, the liquid to solid, actually there's, um, there's less energy in the solid, okay? So I'm going to just take a quick detour. I'm going to regret this. But I have given you what I think is a wonderful example. A frying pan with an ice cube on it, ice cube being given energy and eventually the ice cube breaks apart and just forms liquid water. That is this. How many can visualize that? Okay, it's not a big stretch. Okay, I think it's a wonderful example. All right, now I have problems with this one. Okay. I have problems not with liquid. I can, I can see putting an ice tray, you know, water in the freezer and slowly the energy gets sucked away from the, uh, the, the water that's in the ice tray and then eventually, boom, it crystallizes. I can see that, okay? But where's the energy? Where is that 6.01 kilojoules per mole? I have a hard time seeing that energy, okay? And, and for years, for a dozen years as a matter of fact, I asked the students in the class, I said, students, you're young, you're smart, you're creative, give me an example, a nice example that I can explain to everybody or show everybody where they're going to say, oh, that energy goes here, okay? Or let's say this is H2O liquid going to H2O gas. That's even bigger, right? H2O liquid, H2O gas, that number is 40.7. You got to boil the heck out of that water to make it go. Do you ever notice how long it takes to boil water? You ever looked at a thing of water? It's all at 100 degrees, folks. That pot that's boiling, 100 degrees. Sits there, takes forever to boil away. Why? That's a lot of energy that it's getting because it takes 40.7 kilojoules of energy to make it happen, okay? A lot of energy goes into it. How then do we get that energy back? I don't have a good uh, feel-good thing. I can watch that pot boil and slowly, you know, gases go off and I can, if it's like a clear, like a glass or Pyrex thing, I can actually see the water level decreasing, okay, ever so slowly. But I had to put a lot of energy into that thing and it didn't increase the temperature one bit. Once it starts boiling, it's all 100 degrees. Where does that energy come back as? So I've asked students and I used to say, I'll give you 10 points. Just 10 points. If you can send me an email that gives me a good, a feel-good example of this. And you cannot believe how many stupid emails I got. <laughs> Stupid because it's like the students think I'm really stupid. <laughs> oh, Professor Blake, just go up to a mirror and go, <sighs> and you'll see the condensation. I'm thinking, I understand condensation, idiot. <laughs> I want to know where's the energy. Okay. Okay, now, now are you going to try and give me an example? No. Good. 
I was just going to say, wouldn't it be like part of entropy, like the overall? No. Okay. No. A lady last night said entropy. Entropy is, no, th th there's a lot of energy that has to go back, okay? When I have my soda, if I have a cold soda, on a, particularly on a rainy day like we had last week, I would have condensation all over this thing, okay? And my question is, we went from the gas phase to the liquid phase. Where is the energy from that heat of, of uh, vaporization, okay? And the answer, I mean, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm boring you and, um, and it's like almost useless because all of you will have ideas, but once again, I want to actually, I want to visualize the, because I can see that frying pan with that ice cube and the flame coming underneath it. I can s visualize the energy going into that ice cube and making it turn into liquid. And then I can watch that pot boil and slowly the level of the water just keeps going down there and I can see that energy just going into it. Problem is, where's all that energy when it condenses? That's the problem, okay? So, it's not entropy. So I'm just going to move on because I don't want any emails that, that make it look like I'm a complete idiot. Oh, Professor Blake, you know, when I cook noodles, there's a steam that happens. No kidding. I mean, anyway, I will tell you someday what the answer is. I didn't come up with the answer. It was a pilot, a pilot that came up with the answer. Okay, enough of this. So, very important, look at this. If you multiply both sides of the equation by two, if I need two waters for whatever reason, then I need to multiply the whole thing through by two. This side by two, this side by two, and this by two. Okay? Because if I say what is the delta H of, uh, of uh, fusion for two moles of water, then I got a two here. Okay? <laughs> And this multi has to be multiplied by two, okay? You must keep track, folks, of the state, okay? It's going to become painfully obvious in a minute. I'm not sure this is a good, okay, do this problem right now. Phosphorus is 31. Molecular weight of phosphorus is 31. I'm not going to give you that on the exam. You can have a periodic table. So I've just given you the hint. Oh, well, if P is 31, Don must expect me to do something with that. Okay. You got one minute to do this problem. And unfortunately, this has nothing to do with this. I have no idea why it's on the same slide. You're doing this problem, folks. Okay, time's up. Well, who's got an answer? You. Okay, so negative what? 25,000, he says. Okay, so 25,000. His bad, never mind. Who's got another answer? You. 6,000 what? Okay, 6,000. Okay, so. Folks, how did this guy know that he was wrong at the beginning? Okay. What is the molecular weight of this? 31 times 4. Right? 31 times 4. So 120. So 120 grams per mole. And there's this. There's about 2 moles. Right? If I divide this by 120, I get about 2. Okay, I'm being sloppy. So two then, two moles 
is going to be multiplied by 2. So it's going to be about negative 6,000. Do you get that now? Yeah. Okay. What would you do wrong? Okay, so he, he, got, he, did a, he did a stupid mistake, the same mistake I made when I was a freshman in college. Because for oxygen, oxygen is 16. And guess what? I said 16 for this instead of 32. So don't forget, folks, that number right there is huge. I got zero points on that exam. I thought I was so smart, and I got a zero. So uh, don't get cocky. So do you understand what you're supposed to do? This is about as simple as you can get. Convert to moles, and once you got moles, this is how much was given off. How much heat is when that much phosphorus is burned, and that is for one mole right there. Okay? Very simple, very straightforward. Oh, jeez. Okay. Any questions? So, there is a problem, folks, sort of a semantics problem, okay? I didn't ask. I didn't ask what was the delta H of this, did I? What did I say? How much heat is given off? Engineers do not like negative numbers for heat, okay? It makes no sense. I agree with them. So you have to be careful. If the question was, what is the delta H, you know, of, of uh, or what is the delta H when this much is given off or this much is burned, then this number would be a delta H is equal to minus 6470 kilojoules. But in terms of energy given off, it's this much. Okay? You understand? Now I'm not going to try and be a tough guy on the exam. Okay, because I find this a little bit confusing myself. Um, but if you're asked for the delta H, then you've got to keep your negatives, okay, or positives. But if it's a question of how much energy is given off, okay, that's like me saying, okay, I take out my wallet and I give you $20, okay? If you say, what is the delta H for Don's wallet, it's negative 20. But if it says, how much money did Don give her? Did I give, you, did I give her negative $20? No. I gave her 20 bucks. So you got to read the question, okay? I'm not going to try and be tricky, but this is just an example of how much heat has evolved. You don't have a negative fire, okay? Okay, this one, folks. You know what? This is in your thing. Okay, this is the where I, uh, uh, this is the one I swore on last night. Okay, so I'm just gonna. This whole thing is just to show you that the delta E and the delta H are oftentimes very very close. Okay, <clears throat> so what happens is um, you had one mole of gas, H2 gas, given off by this reaction. Okay, one mole right there. Okay, what did I say was the volume of a mole of gas? 22.4 liters, right? But folks, that's 22.4 liters at STP, which is at 273. At 273 degrees, one mole on average is 22.4 liters. But this problem says 25 degrees. What is 25 degrees in Kelvin? 298. So I want you right now to multiply 22.4. Do it. Because last night, it took forever for these kids to figure it out, and I'm not sure they ever figured it out. You're going to multiply 22.4. Now, as in gases, folks, gases get bigger when they're warmer. Okay? Bigger when they're warmer. So you have to correct. We're at 298. You got a 298, and you got a 273. So what are we going to multiply 22.4 by to do this correction? It's going to be a bigger volume because it's hotter. So it's going to be 22.4 times 298 divided by 273. And what's the answer? 24.5. Okay. That's where this 24.5 came from. Last night, like I say, it took 10 minutes for these people. Three times I went through this discussion. And then I said a bad word. 
So the main thing here, folks, is that this reaction gives off a lot of heat. Look at this. 367.5, okay? How much work was done? Nothing. Very tiny. This whole thing is just a, an exercise to show you that, okay, in a case like this, it's the delta H that's the, the driver, okay? It's really what's driving the bus. And this little bit of here, this is almost noise. It's less than 1% of this, okay? So in this case, I'm not sure what the next slide says, but I think it's almost like the delta E is almost equal to delta H. Okay. So very little difference, okay? All right, now, do this. Now, in this case, it's saying the sign and the magnitude, okay? So that means you need to come up with a delta H. That's that terminology. So do this one right now. If you can do the other one, you can do this one. Okay, carbon, 12, 16, 32. Okay, 12, 16, and 32 are the molecular weights. Okay, we got an answer? Folks, this is not a trick. Yes. Oh, you got an answer. Oh, okay. What's the answer? Okay, so he says about negative 3685. Something like that. Okay. All right. So, what is the molecular weight of carbonyl sulfide? What is it? 60? Okay. Let's say it's 60. Now, last night, the students got freaked out because they didn't understand why in the end I divided by 2. Okay. So, let me ask you this. This is 60, right? 56? What is the molecular weight? 60. What? 32 is 60. Okay. So 60 grams, if I divide that by 60, I get 6.74. Okay. But I got two of them here, right? This is saying, look, when I've got this much, I get that much. So you really should, you, you could do it and say, okay, well, actually, 60 plus 60. I get for 120 grams, I get that much. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, folks? Okay, because for this reaction, I get about 1,100 kilojoules per mole of energy given off. Okay, for this reaction. And how much weight was it that I used? I used 120, right? Because there's two of those, all right? So 120, Divided into that is about three, right? So I would look at this and I'd say, okay, I got three times that. It's going to be a value of about negative 3,000. That's how I would look at it very quickly, okay? So I'll show you the math. So look, you got 6.74 moles, right? So most of you, what you did was you multiplied that then times that, and you got some number of like 8,000. Okay, or something big. How many got that big number? Okay. And that's because you did not figure in that you have two moles here. Okay, so you have to look at this 
if you if you wanted to make it one mole folks if you wanted to make it one mole you divide this whole thing by two divided by two this number now becomes minus 546 and then you multiply 546 times that and you get the right number okay coefficients folks you got to pay attention so there's the answer is that what we got How many got that answer? Okay, good, good. How many got that answer after I gave some help? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm helping somebody. All right, change gears. Heat capacity, folks. The heat capacity. They're both water, colored water, okay? Which has a higher heat capacity? This thing. Takes more energy to warm it up, right, or to cool it down. That's what heat capacity means, okay? So you got something big of the same material, you got a higher heat capacity than you have if you have a smaller one, okay? That's heat capacity. Specific heat, though, specific heat is for one gram, okay? So one gram of something is the specific heat. That's what this is, okay? So let's look at graphite here. Specific heat means that you would need 0.72 joules to heat up one gram of graphite. Okay, that's what specific heat means. It's how much energy you need to heat up one gram, okay? One degree. Okay, so look at, now this is the molar. All you have to do, what is the molecular weight of carbon? 12. I want you to multiply that number by 12 and I'll bet you, you get that number. All these numbers are, folks, is this number times 18. This number times 18. Uh, this number times a bigger number. Okay, because the molecular weight's bigger. These are the molar so if I say you got a mole of water, this is what you use. If I say you got a gram of water, this is what you use, okay? So all it's saying is, is that certain things can hold more energy, all right? And that's either specific heat or heat capacity. And so we're going to be talking about that. And basically it's going to be the, this is the molar, this is going to be the molar times the actual heat capacity times the change in temperature is equal to the actual amount of heat, okay? We're well, gonna do a problem, don't freak out. Okay, here's a simple one. We got a kilogram of molybdenum, we, has a molecular weight of 95, we got water of a kilogram. So both the same mass, okay? So I got a bucket of water, and I got a very hot piece of molybdenum, okay? The molybdenum is uh, I don't think it says anything here. Anyway, I'm going to drop the molybdenum bar into the hot water. They both weigh the same amount. Which one is going to change by a greater degree? If I have something hot here, this is at 100 degrees and I drop it into something that's at zero degrees, okay, they both weigh the same. If they have the same heat capacity, then guess what? The temperature will end up 50 degrees. Okay, think about it. If I have a pot of water, one of my pots of water, liter of water, is 20 degrees Celsius, and I got another one the exact same size as 30 degrees. If I pour them together, what is the final temperature? 25, right? Who doesn't get that? All I'm saying is, is that if I have the same exact stuff, in this case water, at two different temperatures, okay, if I've got a liter at 20 degrees C and a liter at, at 80 degrees C, 20 and 80, I pour them together into a bigger pot, what is the temperature of the big pot? Do it. 20 and 80, what is the temperature once I've mixed them? 
Answer right now. Somebody raise your hand. You. 50 degrees. That's right. They're the same heat capacity and the same volume. Okay? That's a pretty simple concept. Okay? You should be able to get that. So the, pro the point is, okay, now let me ask you this question. Okay? If you have one liter of something at zero degrees, or, or, or 273, and two liters of something at 20 degrees, what is going to be the final temperature? Answer. 14 or 15. That's if you're mixing the same stuff, folks. Okay, how many of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about? Okay. Once again, it's like adding hot water to cold water. Okay, yes? So volume doesn't matter? Uh, no, I told you the volume matters, absolutely. A liter and a liter. No, absolutely, because a liter and two liters, volume matters. Absolutely volume matters, but in my examples, I gave you one liter at 10 degrees and one liter at 30 degrees. And I poured them together and I said, what is the final temperature? Okay, and it's just going to be the average between the two. 10 and 40 makes 50 divided by 2. The temperature is going to be 25 degrees in this pot. Okay, now that's when it's simple. It's not always so simple. Okay, because not everything has the same heat capacity, which is good for us. Okay, so in this case, what is the relative temperature change in magnitude when one kilogram of a hot molybdenum is dropped into a cool water? Okay, that's this. Pot of water, one kilogram. Molybdenum, one kilogram. Drop it in. Okay, well, you tell me. Look at this. We don't know. We don't have enough information, do we? Because we don't know what the heat capacity, we know heat capacity of water okay is is 4.1 but we don't know what the heat capacity of molybdenum is okay so if the heat capacity of molybdenum is less than water then it's not really carrying a lot of heat with it okay so you drop it into the cool water this hot thing here it doesn't have as much heat capacity so you put it in if one was at zero and one was at hundred and this has less heat capacity then it's going to change the temperatures going to be closer to the water temperature, then it will be closer to this. If instead the heat capacity of this is huge, then it's going to change the water a greater amount. Okay? So that's, we're going to give us some information, but these are the three questions that they're asking. Okay, now there it is. Look at that. Heat capacity is this. So this thing doesn't have much of a heat capacity at all. Okay? So that means that the water, you know, the water at cool versus this at hot that this thing cools down much faster with just a little bit less energy than this thing does, okay? This is going to warm up a bit. This is going to cool down a lot. Does that make sense? Smaller heat capacity means that it can only hold a certain amount of heat. Okay? So, one gram of this only going to change 0.25. One gram of this, four degrees. Okay, or four joules. It's a, you got you to put a whole lot more energy into the water to make it change by a degree than you do this. So what's the answer? The change in this molybdenum that drops in, because it can't handle much heat capacity, doesn't have a very, has a low heat capacity, it's going to go from hot to almost cold. What's that? No, it's not. Think about it. Which one's going to change the most? The molybdenum. So its change is greater than the change of water. What's that? This. Get rid of that. I didn't make this slide up. Sorry, guys. Okay, specific heat. Same thing, okay? Specific heat is on a gram basis. Look at that. There's a gram right there in the units. Folks, do not forget units. Josette and I were going over the exam yesterday. 
and it was like the units were telling us what to do, right, Josette? I mean, it's amazing. And if you forget solids and liquids and gases, you're completely screwed, okay? So this is the specific heat for one gram, okay? One gram. Look at water down here at four. It's ten times, has a specific heat ten times greater than that of iron, okay? But this is if it's specific heat. So then we have the heat capacity, which is then equal to the mass times this, okay? So what is the heat capacity of water if I have 10 grams of water? What'd you say? Yes. It's 41.8 there times 10, 42 joules is the heat capacity. So all you got to do is look at a table like this, put it into this equation, that's the heat capacity, okay? Let's do a problem. All right, let me, okay, then heat absorbed or released. The heat, Q, is equal to the M times the S times the delta T. So we can make an MS, either that if I give you the heat capacity, but uh, I usually I'll just give you the mass and the heat capacity itself and the change in temperature. So, there it is. Delta T, final minus initial. Okay? Delta T, final minus initial. So, look at this. Do this problem. How much heat is given off when 869 grams of iron uh, go, cools from uh, 94 to 5 degrees? Okay, and we're given S. Right? We're given the grams, we're given S, and we're given delta T. We're not given delta T, but you can figure out delta T. What is delta T? Minus 89, right? It's just 94 take away 5. Or sorry, 5 take away 89. No, sorry, 5 take away 89. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Jeez. Minus 89 is the right answer. Okay. So delta T is minus 89. You've got 800 or 869 grams, and there's a specific heat. Look at the units, folks, okay? Look at the units. You're going to have to have grams on top to get rid of that, because the question is how much heat is given off? What is heat? It's in joules, right? You've got to get rid of joules, and you've got to get rid of temperature. So look at what happens. Minus 89, that's what I was trying to say. Q is equal to ms. There's your mass, there's your S, times minus 89C, okay? Notice that C is in the denominator, in the numerator, this is the denominator. I think I crossed them out. Yeah, look at that. Grams cancels, degrees cancel, and I'm left with just joules, okay? Very simple, very straightforward, okay? Now, do this. This is discussion question 720. People are asking me, what do I need to study for the exam? Okay. One of the questions, I got an email from somebody in last night's class with this as an email saying, I don't understand. Okay. Even though we went through it. Okay. So, this is the kind of question you're going to get on the exam. I promise. I promise. Okay. Promise. So you're given specific heat. This change went from 22 to 25. This one went from 20, uh, that's 20 grams at 100 degrees. And it went down to, I'm not sure, 22. I can't read upside down. I guess I can read from here. So it goes uh, 100 degrees, is uh, placed in a calorimeter, uh, and the water's 22. The final mixture is 25.7. So what's delta T? What's delta T, folks, for this new metal? Just figure out what is delta T for the new metal. It's about 75 degrees, right? And it got colder, okay? And it's final minus uh, initial, so it's minus 75 is the delta T. What's the delta T for water? It's about plus four. Started at 20, went to about 26, right? You get that? 
So you got the two deltas, all right? Here's what you do, okay? The question is, what is the heat capacity for this new metal? Well, you've got 20 grams of it times the 25 minus 100. So you multiply that whole thing through and you end up with a 1486 grams um, uh, per degree times this heat capacity. We don't have the heat capacity. That's what we're solving for. So you got this is a times that, okay? So it's, um, so one side of the equation is this. You set the two equations equal to each other. Look at this next one, okay? How many grams of water did we have? 50.9, 50.7. Heat capacity is this, and it went from 20, from 22 to 25. So we got a negative, about a negative four there. Set them equal to each other. So this is what we had on the other page. Just to multiply that through right now, just do the math. I think some of you don't understand math. So you notice that if I multiply all these things together, I get that value right there, 784 joules. I got delta T, I got the heat capacity, and I got the mass, okay? So I've got, this is how many joules in energy the water gained. That must mean that, that this lost that much. So that's why you're, they're setting equal to each other. Now look at this. Now we've got a, a 1486 grams per degree, uh, gram degrees times the CS. This is what we're solving for. This is what we're solving for. So how do you do that in math? You just take everything from this side and stick it under here. Okay? And what do you get? That. About a half a degree. Or half of, half of a joule per degree gram. This is problem 720. It was last week's assignment, but it's certainly fair game to ask this week. Okay? Hess's law, we've got to move on to this quick, folks, because this is on the exam. Practice, it's, so, folks, if you didn't notice in your solution manual, all of the odd values of the problems at the back of the chapter are done. So probably 719 or 721 looks just like this, okay? So if I didn't do a good job of explaining it or going through it, you can use that, okay? The book is a resource. Hess's law just says, doesn't matter, it's a state function. Doesn't matter how you got somewhere, um, you change the signs, multiply by something all the way through, um, and we can kind of play with equations. So here's an example. We can make N2 and O2 into NO2. Okay? We can do that. It costs us 68 kilojoules of energy. Okay? Or we can take two paths. We can break the N, we can make N2 and O2 into NOs. That costs us a lot more energy, not 68, but 180. But then if you put two NOs with oxygen to form NO2, you get off, off energy. Okay, and look at that, 68. If you, delta 2 plus delta 3 equals 68, just like that one. So what we're saying is, once again, perpetual motion doesn't work. Okay, um, and so we're going to use Hess's law to help us figure out what some of the delta H's are for certain reactions, okay? This is just a visual, okay? You can either go up, over, and down. This was the 180, this is the minus 112. Here's 68, or different path. But when you get NO2, NO2, it still costs you 68 kilojoules. Okay, so we have, folks, things that just happen in nature. Oxygen, O2, N2, anything that happens in nature in the, in the state that it's in at 25 degrees C in one atmosphere is what we call naturalism. It doesn't cost us anything, okay? When you run your car, you don't worry about the fact that you're burning up oxygen, okay? The oxygen is right there and you use it. So, uh, so what we have is what we call the uh, heats of formation of certain things and by definition, 
And we're going to say things like this. Heat of formation of oxygen doesn't cost you anything. If you're an engineer and you're designing a, a, a plant or a car, you do not have to worry about any kind of energy going into making oxygen. However, why about gasoline? Sure, gasoline, you got to put money into it. You got to put energy into making gasoline. So that costs you something. Carbon, graphite. Graphite is the, uh, uh, the uh, delta H of formation is zero for graphite. Okay, so this is all stuff you should just read, okay? It's, it's boring stuff. Um, look it over. We're going to do a problem. Okay, so once again, the, the, the delta H of formation uh, of oxygen is equal to zero. Ozone is not. Okay, it takes this much ozone, that much energy to make ozone. Graphite, diamonds, big deal. So there are tables, folks. Look at this table. F2, zero. H2, zero. Chlorine gas, zero. Certain things like that. O2, zero. Anything that's a zero means it's free. Okay? Anything, though, with a value means that, that this is not, this is not how, uh, how things occur naturally. So, products minus reactants, folks. Okay? This is exactly how you do things. This is kind of complicated. But now we're going to do, hold on, this, do this. This is the kind of ex question you're going to get on an exam, okay? So, calculate the standard enthalpy of formation for CS2 liquid. This is the equation, okay? This is the equation. That's, I didn't have that in your notes. The no it was down here. But that's the equation you've got to come up with. And you're given this. So it's a game. It's a game, folks. How do you arrange these guys in the order, backwards order, frontwards order, multiplying by one, two, three, four, five, or six to end up getting that? Okay, that's what Hess's Law is all about. So, that's what you're trying to do. You add reactions. So, we need a graphite on this left side. Look at that. See that right there? Graphite. And there's one right there. Do we have to change it at all? No. It's already graphite, it's graphite on the left side, and it's one graphite. So we just move that equation down here and put it right there. Now what do we need next? Rhombic. We need two of these guys, right? So we're going to put this equation down here, but we're going to multiply everything by two. Look at that. See the two here? Because that's what we needed up there. So everything is multiplied by two. See that times two out there? <coughs> So you multiply everything through by two. Now the problem, folks, is this. Look at this equation. We were given this, but it's supposed to be on that side. Oops, that's supposed to be an arrow right there, sorry. It's supposed to look like that. So what do you got to do? You got to take this equation and flip it, okay? We're going to flip it, which means you got to change the sign of the delta H, right? Flip it from one side to the other. So now this is a positive instead of a negative. So now look at that. We got, I think, everything we need. Okay? So now let's go ahead and count how many oxygens. I'm going to ask somebody a question. You. How many oxygens on the left side? O2s. Three, she says. Okay? Now, how about you? How many on the right side? Three. Perfect. We cross those out, okay? How many um, uh, SO2s on the left side? Two and two, those cross out. And how many CO2s on the left side? One and one, those cross out. So you know what you're left with? This plus this goes to that, okay? So then you just add them up, watch this. Okay, so. Delta H reaction is equal to that right there. Folks, Hess's Law is on the exam. Do not, not learn it. Okay.